Good morning, everyone, and welcome to 3PB's um, commercial practice group talk. Just while people fill in the room, um, I'm going to just, uh, give you a bit of an introduction to what we're about to be discussing um, and to remind you of a few things that uh, we have available to you. Um, if you haven't already, do have a look at our website. We have at 3pb.co.uk forward slash commercial. Um, at the bottom of that, after you've got our list of members, there are a few um, links to interesting articles. Um, that we've done in the past. At the moment, we have a few there in relation to data protection. Uh, we have some in relation to costs orders, some in relation to the case of triple point and PTT on liquidated damages and liability caps. Um, and there's quite a, a, a large resource of information that you might find useful to you. Um, Charles, you've done an article recently, haven't you? I have um, on non-party cost orders and how difficult, if not nail on impossible, they are to obtain. So it's well worth reading um, if anyone has some time and is interested in non-party cost orders. And certainly so, I think you've had one of your own as well. Uh, I've done a couple, but one on triple point, which is about liquidated damages, um, and a previous one in relation to uh, a court of appeal that discussed interp interpretation of orders. Um, we're just waiting for the last few minutes, few, few seconds of people to log in. We have um, quite a lot of participants already, and we'll get going at uh, 11.02. So and um, if you want to go and grab a glass of water or anything, um, you have 10 or 15 seconds to do that before we get going. Also, there is a Q&A function. So if you've got any questions as we go along, uh, feel free to post them on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Right, it's 11.02. We will get going. Um, as I said, for people who haven't joined us already, welcome to the 3PB's commercial uh, practice group discussion. I'm Seb Oren. Um, I'm a practitioner that uh, practices predominantly in relation to professional negligence claims, particularly in the construction sector. Um, Charles Ovine is going to be the other speaker. Uh, Charles, do you want to say hi? Hello. Good morning. Um, I'm also in the commercial team uh, with a focus on insolvency um, and companies at disputes um, and also property as well. Um, should we get going, Seb? Yeah, let me just explain the structure of the talks then. We have two talks, both um, broadly related to professional negligence. The first talk by Charles will be in relation to a limitation update covering uh, a few Court of Appeal cases that have been um, handed down recently um, with a focus on professional negligence. And um, The subsequent talk by me will be uh, focusing on the recent scope of duty cases in the Supreme Court and reassessing their impact in commercial disputes. Each talk will take about 20 to 25 minutes, and um, so we'd hope to get to the end of the talk within about 45 minutes to 50 minutes, leaving a few, a few times for questions afterwards. Um, at the bottom of your screen, as you're probably familiar with by now, there is a questions and answer session. Do feel free to put your questions in. Um, we can't promise to answer all of them, but we will um, try and pick out those that are of the greatest general relevance so that we can give you a steer on the topics that we're discussing. Right, without further ado, let me hand over to Charles. Thank you very much. And um, hopefully you can now see um, my slides. Um, so limitation case law update focus on professional negligence. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so this morning I will be running through the recent wave of limitation cases that have been occupying the appellant courts over the last year. Um, as I've mentioned, this should take roughly about 20 minutes. Um, and we have a whistle-stop tour of these six cases to get through, most of which arise in the context of professional negligence claims um, against legal advisors. So as such, we'll be looking really at four aspects or four parts of the Limitation Act. Um, the first is section two of the Limitation Act, which is to do with actions founded on tort. Um, secondly, section 21 of the Limitation Act, um, dealing with trust property. Thirdly, section 32 of the Limitation Act, dealing with the postponement of limitation, um, specifically in respect of mistakes of law. And fourth and finally, um, section 35 of the Limitation Act, in respect of new claims in pending actions. So those uh, six cases I've decided to split into two categories. Firstly, the issue of when does time start running? Um, and secondly, how do you stop time running? Dealing with the first category, um, we've got these five cases. Um, 
if I can take Sicatino and Beaumont, Elias and Hatton solicitors, Holt and Holly and Steer solicitors first, those three um, all relate to um, section two of the Limitation Act. And so we're looking at when does limitation start running for the purposes of section two. Um, Dixon, Coles and Gill is slightly different in that it's um, in relation to section 21. And finally, the FII litigation is in relation to section 32 of the Limitation Act. So without further ado, um, Sicatino and Beaumont. So Sicatino itself is a professional negligence claim against a barrister. Um, the facts of the case are relatively straightforward. So Mr. Beaumont, um, who was the respondent on the appeal, um, gave advice to Ms. Sicatino, the appellant, on the prospects of bringing an appeal on an insolvency issue, which raised a, raised a novel point of law. Um, what was relevant in this case was that the appellant was legally aided. Um, so the barrister gave a first advice in May 2011 and said that the prospects of appeal were strong, um, but did advise that Ms. Sicatino should try and settle the matter as soon as possible, ideally at some point between the time when permission for appeal was granted um, and the actual substantive appeal hearing. Um, what the court did instead was they listed a rolled up permission and substantive appeal hearing. So therefore there wasn't that gap in time between permission being granted um, and the substantive appeal. So therefore waiting for permission before entering into settlement discussions, that time just didn't materialize. Um, to obtain funding for the appeal hearing, um, the barrister needed to provide a second opinion or second advice on prospects um, so that they could then obtain an extension to the appellant's legal aid certificate. Um, and that advice was given in October 2011, sorry, October 2011 on the 26th. Um, and again, the barrister gave um, the matter prospects of success. So therefore there was a second advice which was distinct from the first. Firstly, that the prospects were strong, so that's the same advice, um, but also saying that the matter should proceed to the substantive appeal. So it was slightly different from the first advice in that rather than encouraging settlement, the barrister was saying we should proceed with the substantive appeal. Unfortunately for the barrister and for the appellant, the court didn't share the barrister's view on prospects. And despite the advice of there being strong prospects, the, the appeal was refused. Um, and so therefore the outcome was contrary to the barrister's advice. So what the appellant then sought was to bring a claim against the barrister for the advice that she was given, um, in particular seeking to recover the costs that had been incurred on the appeal. The claim was issued on the 25th of October 2017. So that's after the limitation had passed for the first advice in May 2011, um, giving prospects. Um, so that fell outside of the six year time limit um, under section two. The issue then turned on whether the second advice on prospects was similarly statute barred. So the second advice was just within time, so it was a day within time. Um, and Lord Justice Coulson um, delivered the main judgment. And what he held, uh, in find this at paragraph 62 of the judgment, what he said was, in a case where there are two or more allegedly negligent advices, and therefore two separate breaches of duty, there is no general principle of logic or common sense, which requires any sort of relation back such as to say that the limitation period was triggered by the first occasion on which negligent advice was given, regardless of any subsequent breaches of duty. Um, Lord Justice Stuart Smith also gives quite a helpful summary of the law at paragraphs 103 of his judgment, um, and I'd encourage anyone who's interested in this area um, to have a read of that um, after this webinar. But I mean, perhaps I can summarize it best as, the limitation defence is not available for a second advice which constituted a separate breach of duty um, to the first advice. 
for practitioners who are, deal with this area of law and um, specifically professional negligence claims against legal advisors um, there was an interesting there was an interesting discussion about whether or not summary judgment um, should be applied for in the context of professional negligence claims the argument was that given that there's no need for expert evidence to dispose of a professional negligence claim against a solicitor or a barrister they would be suitable for summary judgment um, and what the court of appeal urged um, well, what they said was the caution should be um, given summary judgment in professional negligence claims against solicitors and barristers should be the exception and not the rule the next decision to take you on to is Elliot and Hatton solicitors, which is a solicitor's negligence claim in respect of a flawed transaction. So again, we're looking at section two of the Limitation Act. So in professional negligence claims for or against solicitors for transactional work, there are two categories of cases. So there's firstly the no transaction claims, and secondly, flawed transaction claims. So on the one hand, we've got the no transaction claims, which is where the lay client would never have entered into the transaction had they been properly advised, i.e. there would be no transaction. And on the other hand, we've got clients who would have entered into the transaction, but would have negotiated different terms, i.e. there was a flawless transaction and they've been deprived of that with this flawed transaction. In the first category, so in non-transaction claims, limitation will run from the point in time at which the claimant entered into a transaction in which he would have been measurably worse off um, than had he not entered into it at all. In contrast, in a flawed transaction claim, limitation runs from when the claimant can measurably demonstrate loss, i.e. when the claimant can show that the flawed transaction had a value which was measurably less than the perfect or flawless um, transaction. So this introduces the concept of when does measurable loss arise, uh, which is relevant both for this claim and the next one we're going to discuss, um, the case of Holt. On the facts of Elliot, um, solicitors, Hatton solicitors were instructed to act on Mrs Elliot's behalf um, to draft a lease agreement with a tenant. The lease was also to include a guarantee to be given by the tenant's parents in the event of damage. Um, but the solicitors were negligent and failed to include that guarantee in the lease. Uh, the tenant vacated the property and Mrs. Elliot, Mrs. Elliot sought to rely on the guarantee um, to recover the damages from the tenant's parents. But as I mentioned earlier, that guarantee wasn't drafted, didn't exist. Um, so she couldn't recover um, her losses as against the tenant's parents, so instead brought a professional negligence claim against her solicitors. The issue for the court was when was the loss or damage, or when could the loss or damage uh, be measured? So was it firstly at the time that the lease was prepared, i.e. when the lease was executed, or was it the later date when the tenant vacated the property and Mrs. Elliot then wanted to bring a claim against um, the parent. Uh, the court held that time would start running from the date that the lease was entered into, as that was the date on which Mrs. Elliot had a measurable loss, i.e. a difference in value between a lease with a guarantee versus the value of a lease without the benefit of a guarantee. The next case to take us on to um, is Holt and Holly and Steer solicitors. Um, this is a litigation claim rather than a transaction claim. Um, but again, it's a claim dealing with Section 2 of the Limitation Act and the concept of when does measurable damage um, arise. The facts on this case are um, Holt and Steer solicitors um, were instructed to act on behalf of Holt in matrimonial proceedings, and they failed to obtain any expert valuation evidence. And because they didn't rely, they didn't obtain any expert valuation evidence, then didn't seek permission to rely 
on any. Because there was no valuation evidence, the lay client Holt had difficulty in articulating what measurable loss she had suffered. Um, again, the issue was whether there had been measurable loss to the lay client, as in these circumstances, the lay client didn't know how much value certain assets would have because of that lack of um, valuation evidence. Um, Lord Justice McCoon delivered the le leading judgment. And in his discussion, he noted that very often in these types of cases, values of claims fluctuate over time. And therefore, it's difficult to determine when the full extent of measurable loss or measurable damage arrives. But um, the solicitor's mistake, but when or the point in time at which the solicitor's mistake can no longer be remedied, so i.e. in the facts of this case, when expert valuation evidence was too late to be obtained and then permission sought to rely on it, um, it was at that time that the lay client's case was inevitably diminished such that measurable loss or damage um, will arise at that time and limitation should run from that date. The next case is Dixon Coles and Gill um, and the Bishop of Leeds. So we're now leaving section two of the Limitation Act behind um, and moving over to section 21, um, specifically section 21 1A of the Limitation Act um, relating to trust property. Um, I appreciate section 21 may not be familiar to everybody. Um, so perhaps if I just read what it provides. So it provides that no period of limitation shall apply to a beneficiary under a trust, um, being an action in respect of any fraud or fraudulent breach of trust to which the trustee was a party or privy. So therefore, the key words in section 21 1A are that the trustee must be a party or privy to the fraud. Um, for time to not start running. Um, otherwise, section 21.3 applies, which says that a party must bring a claim um, within six years. So the facts of the Bishop of Leeds um, case is the Bishop of Leeds and the Diocese of Leeds were clients of Dixon, Coles and Gill. Uh, the firm had three partners, one of whom stole just shy of a million pounds worth of money belonging to the Bishop of Leeds uh, from the firm's client account. There was no allegation that the other two partners were involved or otherwise aware of um, the theft by that, third part, uh, by that third partner. So the Bishop of Leeds brought a claim against the firm um, acting as trustees for the return of the monies that had been stolen. Um, and the issue was whether the two innocent partners of the firm could rely on a limitations offence. The Bishop of Lee's position was no, um, and what they did was try to rely on the provisions of the Partnership Act 1890 um, to find that the two innocent partners were equally liable, um, specifically sections 9 to 12 of the Partnership Act. Section 9 of the Partnership Act, for those who may not be so familiar with it, um, provide that every partner in a firm is jointly liable with the other partners for all debts and obligations of the firm incurred whilst he's a partner. Section 10 provides that where, by any wrongful act or omission of any partner acting in the course of the business of the firm, the firm is liable, therefore, to the same extent as the partner. Section 11 provides that where one partner receives money or miss a applies that money, the firm is liable to make good the loss. And section 12 provides that if section 11 applies, then every partner is jointly liable for the co-partners for everything for which the firm is liable. So the issue here is whether a claim brought against the innocent partners or trustees would be subject to a limitations offence, or whether the partnership was or the provisions of sections 9 to 12 of the Partnership Act were such that limitation, that, yeah, the, that the Bishop of Leeds could rely on section 21 1A um, of the Limitation Act. What the court held was that when, re when reviewing the Partnership Act, um, along with its predecessor, um, 
they held that a co-trustee um, is not to be treated as a party or privy to another trustee's fraudulent breaches of trust um, unless the facts are alleged or and proved which show the co-trustee to have been implicated in the frauds in some way. Um, Lady Justice Aspen in her judgment of paragraph 48 um, similarly held that there is nothing in the Partnership Act 1890 to suggest that a partnership, uh, sorry, that a partner as a result of the partnership relationship um, is deemed to be a party or privy um, to the fraudulent breaches of trust of his fellow partner such that um, section 21 1a would apply to them. Um, and therefore section 21 1a does not apply to innocent trustees um, regardless of the 1890 Partnership Act. The final case uh, to go on to um, is the FII litigation, uh, which was heard in the Supreme Court in November last year. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the FII litigation, it's the Frank Investment Income Group litigation. Um, and for any tax practitioners who are listening, um, please accept my apologies for simplify overly simplifying the facts. But as I understand it, what this is, is it's a group litigation um, where a group litigation brought against HMRC, where some companies were alleging that they were treated differently for corporation tax purposes um, because they were non wholly UK resident companies, as opposed to those companies that were wholly UK resident. Um, this group litigation could have exposed the government and taxpayers to millions, if not billions of pounds worth of rebates. So the issue was whether or not the group litigants were entitled to the repayment of tax that they wrongly paid over to HMRC, or to use the wording of the Limitation Act, um, paid by reason of a mistake of law. Um, and the reason they say there was a mistake of law was because this litigation had gone to the uh, European Court of Justice, um, and the European Court of Justice has held that HMRC ought not to have charged corporation tax to those companies. And therefore, the group litigants brought a restitutionary claim against HMRC for the monies that they paid over to HMRC um, under that mistake of law. So the issue before the Supreme Court was whether, when the claimants were seeking uh, to recover monies paid under a mistake of law, um, whether Section 32.1c of the Limitation Act would postpone the commencements of limitation until such time as the true state of the law uh, would be established by a judicial decision from which there lied, from which there lay um, no rights of appeal. And the court was really looking at two recent or recent-ish cases um, on the law of limitation. The first was uh, Deutsche Morgan Grenfell Group. PLC and the Inland Revenue Commissioners, and the second was Kleinworth Benson Limited and Lincoln City Council, both of which were House of Lords decisions. Um, taking Deutsche Morgan first, um, the House of Lords in that case held that the time started running for the purposes of Section 321C um, from the date that the mistake of law was discoverable. And what the House of Lords did was that they tied that date of discoverability um, with the date when the truth, in inverted commas, um, as to whether the claimants had a well-founded cause of action um, is established um, by a decision of a court of final jurisdiction. The problem with the Deutsche Morgan decision is that mistakes then wouldn't be discoverable until after a claimant had issued a claim on the basis of that mistaken basis of law, and then exhausted the matter all the way through the appellant court. Um, and the Supreme Court was unanimous in its uh, decision that, the, that they should depart from the Deutsche Morgan decision in relation to discoverability. Um, and Lords Reed and Hodge um, gave leading judgments and held and set out what the correct approach should be at paragraph 193 of their judgment, which I'll very briefly read out. Um, so they say, time begins to run under section 32.1c 
when the claimant discovers or could with reasonable diligence discover his mistake in the sense of recognizing that a worthwhile claim arises, i.e. with sufficient confidence to justify embarking on the preliminaries to the issue of a writ, such as submitting a claim to the proposed defendant, taking advice and collecting evidence. So in adopting that approach, um, it brings the line of authorities in line with section 32.1a of the Limitation Act um, as to fraud. The second authority that the Supreme Court were concerned with was whether it wished to stand by the House of Lords position in Kleinworth Benson. So in Kleinworth Benson, the House of Lords said that money is paid by reason of mistakes of law as opposed to mistakes of fact fell within um, the ambit of section 32.1c. So the Supreme Court were tasked with deciding whether or not they wanted mistakes of law to be caught by section 32.1c. Um, the majority held that although the reasoning of Kleinworth Benson was unsupported by convincing reasoning, the ordinary meaning of section 32.1c um, would include mistakes of law. And ultimately, that interpretation, so mistakes of law being included, um, would support ge the general pur underlying purpose of section 32, which is to relieve claimants from the necessity of complying with time limits when they can't reasonably be expected to do so. Um, the minority position as adopted by Lord Briggs and Lord Sales um, was that Kenworth Benson was wrongly decided um, and they took the view that mistakes of law should not fall within the ambit of section 32.1c at all. Um, however, as I say, they are the minority um, and the point, the point now appears to be well settled. This brings, uh, so that brings a conclusion to the issue of when time starts to run. The next issue is how do you stop time running? Um, and Perhaps I can take you to the case of Butters and Hayes, uh, which was decided earlier on this year. Um, so this decision concerns Section 35 of the Limitation Act, which deals with new claims made in the course of any action. So practitioners will be familiar with this under CPR Rule 17.4, um, which, to summarise very briefly, uh, where a party applies to amend his statement of case and the period of limitation has expired for that claim under the Limitation Act, the court may allow, to allow an amendment with the effect of adding or substituting a new claim, but only if the new claim arises out of the same facts or substantially the same facts as the claim in respect of which the party applied for permission has already claimed to remedy. So typical examples of that would be where somebody's brought a claim in contract, um, relying on an implied term as to reasonable care and skill, and then they amend out of time to include an analogous claim in negligence. Um, the issue in Butters and Hayes was whether the non-payment of a court fee meant that time continues to run for limitation purposes in respect of any new claim within existing proceedings i.e. brought about by an amendment. Um, Lord Justice Peter Jackson held that if a new claim which is not otherwise abusive is made by an amendment within the limitation period, it will not later become time barred because the requisite court fee had not been paid. Um, Lord Justice Jackson was fairly scathing in his judgment um, about the appeal generally. Um, dismissed it and labelled it opportunistic and without merit. There's even a nice reference to uh, Bleak House. Um, it might be tempting to read the judgment as an excuse for laziness, um, but practitioners should always still be cautious about calculating whether any additional fees will need to be paid for a claim, um, as it may be that a willful failure to pay the correct court fee could be viewed as abusive and a limitation point being taken. That concludes my part of the talk. Um, I'll answer any questions that you have um, at the end, but I'll now hand over to Seb. For his Thank part. you, Charles. Um, we'll continue directly with the second talk. There will be time for questions afterwards, as I've said, so do feel free to um, post any questions that you might have. I'm just going to share my screen. 
hopefully you can see the slides. Um, the subject matter of this talk is reassessing the scope of duty in commercial disputes, um, and it focuses on two recent Supreme Court cases, um, uh, and there's also been a, a Court of Appeal case. Then it goes straight to the agenda of the issues that I'll be discussing. Um, the first is, what is the purpose of identifying the scope of duty? Um, the second part of the talk will then look at how do you establish a scope of duty? In other words, what exercise do you go through in order to identify what the scope of duty is in any individual case? And then the third one comes back to um, how does that uh, scope of duty exercise apply in cases outside negligent advice? And um, negligent advice was the context of all of the cases that I'll be discussing. And um, so part three considers to what extent can you expand that outside um, that scenario? The Supreme Court, set in the context, has already looked at this advice fairly recently in the solicitor's case of uh, Hughes Holland and BP solicitors. That was in 2017. Since then, we've had two auditor advice cases, Asset Co and Grant Thornton in the Court of Appeal, and Manchester Building Society and Grant Thornton, um, which uh, went up to the Supreme Court. We've also had Meadows and Carr. It's fair to say that even though we've had all this um, authority, um, the issue of scope of duty is continuing to cause problems. Uh, so let's take by way of uh, example. In Manchester Building Society, the Supreme Court um, considered that at every level of the judicial hierarchy getting up to the Supreme Court, the analysis of scope of duty um, had contained errors. It also considered that in the Asset Co decision, so the other principal court of appeal um, decision that considered the issue, the outcome was correct, but not for the correct reasons. The Supreme Court that counseled the presentation of the scope of duty arguments before it had tended to misunderstand the principles. Um, and when we get to the final decision in the Supreme Court, when one applies the principles to the facts, there was disagreement between the various justices as to how the scope of duty applied on the facts. So I think it's fair to say that we had a, a royal flush of misunderstanding of how scope of duty applies. Um, and as Lords Hodgson Sales and the majority indicated, there was a need for authoritative guidance, even though uh, it comes so soon after Hughes Holland. Um, it's worth observing that the um, opinion or the judgment in Manchester Building Society is almost exclusively um, focused on the House of Lords and Supreme Court cases um, and the principles that one derives from those. Um, where Court of Appeal cases are mentioned, it's really only by way of illustration. Um, uh, and so it's really at, at, at that level that one's looking at the um, the authoritative principles from which scope of duty is decided. Um, but final point to mention before I go on to uh, analyze uh, the, the scope of duty principle, Khan was a negligent medical uh, advice case. It was a, a advice given by a doctor in a GP surgery, um, and it was decided by the same constitution, an expanded constitution uh, of seven justices of the Supreme Court at the same time as Manchester Building Society. The judgments tend to cross-reference to each other, and so what I've done in the, in the context of these slides is to identify what seems to me to be the critical um, reasoning that encapsulates the relevant principles and then cross refer to the other judgments where it's necessary um, uh, to see how it's been applied in the other case. Let's start then with part one, which is um, at a very general level, what's the purpose of the scope of duty inquiry? Well, um, the principal purpose is that it's one of the techniques by which the court gives effect to the compensatory principle. So as Lords Hodge and Sales um, uh, said, they set out a framework of seven questions that one would ask in order to analyze um, a, uh, a, a tortious cause of action. And they say the purpose of that framework is to give the value of the claimant's claim for damages in accordance with the principle. The law in awarding to seek damages um, is to place the claimant in the position he or she would have been in absent the defendant's negligence. Um, Lord Burroughs made the point that what one is doing is trying to assess damages linked in a way um, that it is related to the allocation of risk that the parties have adopted in their transaction. So at a uh, high level, that's what this is exercise is about. How does one do that? Well, the basic operation involves two steps. The first step is one of causation. What loss has been suffered in fact? The second step, once, we've, on, once you've assessed that, is to then identify of those losses that were factually caused, which of those fall within the scope of duty? 
Um, so it's, it's a two-step process, uh, one of identifying causation in fact and law, the second one of trying to attribute of those losses um, a smaller part of those that relate to the defendant's um, breach. The order in which those steps, I'll call them step one, step one and, same, and, and step two, the order in which they're, they're undertaken doesn't really matter because they should produce the same result however you do it. But for, for purposes of analysis, it's sometimes easier um, to, to do it in this way. The important point for this purpose is that scope of duty is separate from causation. Uh, it's also separate from remoteness. So for the purpose of assessing scope of duty, you can assume um, that the claim will also establish that there's been a breach, which is a but for and effective cause of the loss. And you can also assume that the loss that we're discussing was reasonably foreseeable or whatever the, the, um, the, the relevant test is in other causes of action. And um, it's a separate limiting factor after you've identified losses that are both caused by and um, uh, sufficiently remote. Uh, this and then it encapsulate the principle, the way in which it was phrased by Lord Leggett in the Manchester Building Society. The first of those steps involves comparing the claimant's actual financial position with what the position would have been if the defendant had performed its duty, that he called the basic comparison. Uh, the second step then involves determining what part of this basic loss was within the scope of the defendant's duty. Um, I've set out the citations in both Khan and in the speech of the other justices that performed and um, uh, that describe that same exercise. But what then is the purpose of those steps? And specifically, why do we need that second stage? And um, well, there are a number of reasons. The principal one is that a duty of care in law is linked to a particular kind of loss. It doesn't leave, um, um, exist in the abstract. And um, consequently, what you can't do is say that the defendants are responsible for a breach but you're going to hold him responsible for a loss that does not relate to that breach. You have to identify a loss that is linked to the nature of the duty. Uh, and importantly, the claimant has to establish both elements. So the burden is on the claimant to establish not only that there has been a loss that is caused, but also one that is um, sufficiently connected to the relevant breach within the scope of duty. Um, a number of passages uh, explain that. So, so again, first looking at Lord, Lord Leggett, in Manchester's Building Society, and um, he uh, put it in this way, it's never sufficient to ask simply whether A owes B a duty of care, it's always necessary to determine the scope of duty by reference to the kind of damage from which A must take B to save harmless. And in relation to the second point, um, that a defendant is not liable in damages in uh, respect of losses of a kind which fall outside the scope of his duty of care. The novelty of um, the economic loss cases, which um, in the modern law start with um, the House of Lords case in uh, South Australia Asset Management, or SAMCO as it's sometimes known, was that it extended that analysis of scope of duty from what had previously, previously been focused on the kinds of loss, so uh, economic loss versus personal injury versus property damage, into one of the quantification of damages. Um, and that's what the Supreme Court thought had tended to cause problems. It's when you're trying to identify out of a single set of economic loss, normally caused because uh, a claimant enters into a transaction, how you separate that single loss in order to identify the quantification that falls within a particular scope of duty. Let's look then at the key features, sorry, let's look then at the key features of the scope of duty. Um, it is an exclusionary rule. That's the way it was described um, by Lord Sumption in BP Solicitors. And what he meant by that is, once you've identified what the, the losses that are causally connected and not too remote, you're trying to exclude from those the losses for which the defendant is not responsible. The speeches of Lords Hodge and Sales in Manchester Building Society, particularly between paragraphs eight and nine, give a useful explanation of how one strips them out or what basis you strip them out. Uh, sometimes you can strip them out because of the kind of loss that we're referring to. So, uh, as I mentioned already, the distinction between pure economic loss uh, and physical harm was the originating um, principle on which one um, uh, dealt with scope of duty complaints. Uh, sometimes you can strip them out because of the kind of claimant that's bringing the claims. And the illustration that they gave was, in Caparo, 
in an order in an order to claim it was established that the duty is owed only to the shareholders of the company not to potential investors so potential investors are excluded from the scope of duty because it's not an, a, a duty that's owed to them a third and final way in which you might exclude a particular kind of loss is in the process of quantification as i say that's the, the complication that arises since Samco. Another key feature of the scope of duty inquiry is that it, it, it is ultimately a question of law. It's heavily dependent on the facts in order to analyze it properly. But once one reaches the conclusion of what the defendant's responsibility is, that is a legal evaluation uh, and a question of law. Uh, and the effect, as Lord Burroughs said, is that it tries to give effect to the party's allocation of risk in their transaction. Uh, let's look then at part two, how do you establish the scope of duty? And I'm setting out what I understand the law to be uh, after uh, Manchester Building Society. So I'm focusing on the speeches that are the majority. They suggested that you ask two questions. Uh, the first is, what are the risks of harm to the claimant against which the law imposes on the defendant a duty to take care? So it's a focus on the risks against which the law provides protection. The second question is, is there a sufficient nexus between the particular element of harm for which the claimant seeks damages and the subject matter of the duty of care? So the second question is focusing on the connection between, on the one hand, the risks against which the defendant was supposed to be protecting the claimant, and on the other hand, the particular loss that's an issue which the claimants are trying to claim. And um, uh, let's look at those in turn to see how the um, Supreme Court used those. Uh, the first of those tests, as um, Lords Hodge and Sales called it, the scope of duty question, is answered by looking at what was the purpose of the duty that the defendant was undertaking, judged on an objective basis by reference to the reason why the advice is being given. In light of that, what risks was the duty supposed to guard against? Uh, and a relevant factor that I'll come back to in a moment is what was the defendant's contribution to the overall transaction that was entered into? Was he a, a limited part of that um, process or was he there guiding the entire process? So the passages that seem to me to reflect that, that analysis, um, in the judgment of Lord Hodge and Sales, in an advice case, the scope of duty of care assumed by a professional advisor is governed by the purpose of the duty, judged on an objective basis, by reference to the reason why the advice is being given and paid for. One looks to see what risk the duty was supposed to guard against, and then looks to see whether the loss suffered represented the fruition of that risk. Uh, and a similar question was asked uh, in relation to Meadows and Carr. Uh, Lord Leggett put in pretty similar terms. Uh, one needs to focus on the need to identify with precision in any given case the matters on which the professional person has undertaken responsibility to advise, and in light of those matters, the risks associated with a transaction which the advisor may fairly be taken to owe a duty of care to protect the client against. Now the purpose, uh, looking at the, the further analysis of uh, the, uh, the lordships, sometimes will be um, uh, assisted by looking at the statutory purpose. So for example, in, a, uh, in an auditor's case, the statutory context under the Companies Act of what the auditor's function is. Uh, in most cases, it will be um, governed by what the defendant has been retained to do, uh, and also the known purpose for which they have been asked to do it. The second uh, aspect of the scope of duty inquiry is the nexus question. That's the connection between the risk and the particular loss. And as I said, the Supreme Court identified the novelty of SAMCO was to apply a scope of duty at the quantification stage. And it was because of that that um, the majority thought it necessary to separate, separate out this nexus question uh, as a different inquiry. It, it really does address the issue of quantification uh, where that's necessary uh, in the context of a um, professional providing a limited advice as part of a wider transaction. Uh, it's acutely uh, relevant to trying to separate out of a single economic loss what part of that the defendant is responsible, responsible for. Uh, so that point again is expressed 
uh, in this passage in Meadows and Calm, uh, which makes clear that it is principally related to the quantification of damages. And in that context, the duty nexus question addresses how the defendant's scope of duty determines the extent of the defendant's liability. Uh, what the nexus question requires, um, uh, let's start with um, an obvious point that isn't always recognised. It has nothing to do with how important the relevant information was to the claimant's decision. In other words, the fact that the information provided by the defendant turns out to be critical to the claimant's decision to enter into the transaction has nothing to do with the scope of duty. That establishes causation, but we've already dealt with that. Uh, what it is concerned with is the nature of the risk against which the defendant is trying to guard against versus what it is that made his breach wrongful. And if there's a, a sufficient connection between those two, then uh, the loss will be recoverable. I mentioned before that a particular factor is whether the defendant was only providing some of the information to guide the transaction, or whether they had a more um, complete role in guiding the entire process. In cases prior to the um, Supreme Court's decision in Manchester, that was the, dis the distinction between advice versus information that had developed following Sanko. And the Supreme Court didn't like that distinction. Um, they, they thought it wasn't particularly useful because it hides the process of trying to categorize cases into those two instances. What's more important is to identify uh, why uh, or what particular risk the defendant is responsible for. Um, and there may be a spectrum of cases where at the lowest end, he's only providing one piece of information for a wider transaction. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, they're providing the entire uh, information on which the decision is going to be based. Um, that analysis is unnecessary. And the pigeonholing between advice and information is unnecessary. If you go down to the primary inquiry of um, what is the relevant risk? What are the losses that are connected to that risk? So as expressed by the majority, this explains what the nexus question is trying to achieve. It's trying to address whether the loss flowed from the right thing, that's to say the particular feature of the defendant's conduct which made it wrongful. It's a, a connection between, on the one hand, the loss, and on the other hand, what made the defendant's um, conduct wrongful. Uh, Lord Leggett expressed the same point, so it seems to me that the, um, the, the slight difference in conceptual emphasis um, doesn't make any difference to the nature of the inquiry which is what makes the information or advice wrong and the connection between that and the loss. Uh, there is a technique that developed since SAMCO of posing a counterfactual. And the counterfactual is a technique that's used in order to perform the analysis that I've just described as part of the scope of duty. Um, Lord Leggett tried to use and to explain that technique um, and as a result of that, his approach was seen to be more based on causation. And that conceptual understanding um, was not agreed with the majority. Um, it's probably worth just explaining because all of the Supreme Court justices thought that this was a useful cross-check. Uh, what it does is it goes through the same exercise that I've just done, but in terms that are phrased in terms of causation. The idea behind it is this. In a case in which the defendant is only supplying limited information for a transaction, he's only responsible for the consequences of that information being wrong. He's not responsible for the entire losses uh, that result from the transaction being entered into. So if, for example, the entire transaction uh, would have failed anyway because it was uh, an insolvent purchase of a business, then that's not necessarily a risk for which the, the defendant would be responsible if he hadn't advised on the solvency or the business merits of the transaction. Uh, given that principle, that the defendant's only responsible for his advice being wrong, a loss that would have been suffered even if his advice had been correct will be outside his scope of duty. And so the counterfactual analysis poses the hypothesis, if the defendant's information had been correct, would the scope of duty have been suffered, would the loss have been suffered anyway? Uh, and if the answer to that is yes, then it suggests that the defendant shouldn't be responsible. Uh, let me illustrate these principles now on the facts of Meadows. Uh, Meadows was a case in which a lady consulted a doctor 
wanting to know if she carried genes that would make her child susceptible to a blood clotting illness, uh, haemophilia. The wrong tests were undertaken that wouldn't have disclosed that. And instead of noticing that the wrong tests had been undertaken, in a consultation with Mrs. Khan, um, the doctor advised that she had the all clear. As a result of that, she enters into, or she has a baby, and the birth gives, uh, the mother gives birth to a child who suffers from haemophilia. Um, had she received the correct advice, um, she would not have gone through with that pregnancy. The complicating factor was that the child also suffered from a separate condition, autism, and the claim was in respect of the costs of care related to two of those illnesses. Some were related to autism, some related to the additional, uh, additional care that was going to be required uh, by the autism. On a conventional analysis, one would go through, first of all, factual causation. Uh, so, but for the negligent advice, the mother would not have had the child that was satisfied. It was established in the courts below that it was not too remote and that it was also legally caused. When you move then to step two, the scope of duty, one asks the question, what were the risks in light of the purpose advice of the advice that the doctor was being asked to provide? And that was to exercise reasonable care in advising the mother whether or not she'd be a carrier of haemophilia gene. It did not extend to advising on whether she'd be a carrier of anything that would um, uh, relate to autism. One then asks the next question, the nexus question, what, given that the risk of the advice was haemophilia, not autism, was there a sufficient link between the damages? Uh, well, there would have been in relation to the cost of treatment for haemophilia, so those were recoverable, but there wasn't a necessary link in relation to the costs relating to autism. And that's the conventional analysis. The counterfactual analysis produces the same result, but by a different question. You don't change the facts, so you assume that the mother still goes through with the pregnancy, has a baby who suffers from the same two illnesses, but you assume for the purpose of analysis that the matters that were misstated by the doctor were true. The doctor had told her she was not a carrier of the haemophilia gene. You assume that that was the, the correct and then ask, would the loss have been suffered anyway? Now, if she had not been a carrier of the haemophilia gene, then the costs of the autism care, which one related to it, would still have been suffered. On the other hand, the costs of the haemophilia care would not have been suffered. So that, that, that produces the same result in identifying, um, but by a sort of causation-based analysis, uh, why it is that one set of losses were within the scope of duty, but others weren't. The important point about the counterfactual mechanism um, is that it is only a cross-check. There's no need for it if you go through the conventional analysis. And part of the problem in the Court of Appeal is that it led to such a convoluted process for trying to work out what the auditor's um, cross um, uh, counterfactual mechanism was, and that the Court of Appeal had been misled or had, had performed the wrong analysis. So you need to be particularly careful to construct the counterfactual in a way that identifies what the relevant wrong was and simply assumes that in the counterfactual. Uh, this is the passage of uh, Lord Leggett in, that emphasizes how the, the counterfactual is to be produced. The key point is you assume the facts remain the same in the sense that the claimant would, um, would not have acted differently. And you ask simply whether or not the loss would have resulted uh, on the hypothesis that the matter that was misrepresented had been correct. That's how one analyzes scope of duty. Let's move to part three, even the final part of this talk, which is how does that apply outside the categories of negligence? Um, the starting point is that the Supreme Court recognized that the foundation of the duty in all the cases that it was discussing was in contract. So Lord Hodge and Sale say that the extent of the responsibility assumed by the professional advisor and the extent of their liability if they fail to act with reasonable care is the same in tort and in contract. The scope of the parallel duty of care and contract depends on the same factors. So in principle, the fact that these were contractual causes of action are uh, irrelevant to the analysis, and um, the same process applies both in tort and contract. 
one then asks, how does it apply outside the context of negligent advice? Uh, Lord Burroughs and Leggett were quite keen to, to contain it to that scenario. Um, it's clear from those, the two cases that we've been discussing that it certainly applies to auditor cases. It certainly applies to uh, medical um, negligent advice. Uh, and it seems in principle to apply to any form of negligent advice. Outside of the context of advice, there have been some attempts to bring in scope of duty, but have not tended to be particularly successful. Um, and most of the legwork that's done by the sort of scope of duty analysis that we've been discussing tends to be done under the guise of remoteness. So uh, just cantering through how that's developed, in 2008, in the Achilleas, Lord Hoffman thought that there might be particular cases where in a contractual situation, even though you fall within limb one of Hadley and Baxendale, in other words, a loss is not unlikely to occur, they might still be excluded if you conclude that the claimant uh, would not, uh, the, the defendant would not have undertaken responsibility for it. Uh, subsequent decisions, and most recent one of uh, significance is John Grimes' partnership in Gubbins, and um, suggests that this, base, this is based on Lim one being a default rule of contract, and that in order for that to be disapplied, there must be some evidence of circumstances that render the implied assumption of responsibility inappropriate. What you effectively have to have are circumstances in which there is an implied term that limits or excludes what would be an ordinary loss falling within Lim one of Hadley, uh, of Hadley and Baxendale. Uh, there is, however, some uh, relatively recent uh, guidance which shows that scope of duty can have a relevance in contract. Um, one such illustration is Greenway and Johnson Matthey. This was a claim by employees against their employers for loss of earnings, so a uh, financial loss claim. Uh, the employees had been exposed to platinum salts and they were redeployed to a different job and suffered loss in earnings as a result. Uh, the cause of action was based on an implied term that the employer that the employer would take reasonable steps to ensure the employees were safe while at work. And the analysis of the Court of Appeal, interestingly by Lord Justice Sales uh, before he moved to the uh, Supreme Court, supports a scope of duty analysis to why in that implied term that was dealing with health and safety, there should not be uh, liability in respect of economic costs. So that's an illustration of um, uh, scope of duty being applied in a contractual setting in order to remove a kind of loss from an implied term. Uh, that leads us to ask, why is an obligation of care any different? Why should it make a difference between a contractual warranty of, let's say, satisfactory quality in, in a sale of goods and a professional services contract of care and skill? Why does one require a scope of duty analysis when one doesn't? Um, there's a suggestion in Flenny and Leach and Solicitor's Liabilities uh, that one way of analysing this is that because the contractual standard in a reasonable care and skill case is the same as the ordinary one in tort, the principles of causation, remoteness and the uh, scope of duty derive from a tortious analysis. Um, that seems to me to have a, a, a couple of problems. It's certainly not the case in relation to remoteness, as a number of Court of Appeal uh, decisions have uh, held. And so perhaps there's some other explanation. Uh, and perhaps those derive from the fundamental features that were identified by uh, the Supreme Court as those that engage SAMCO. Those are essentially that you are relying on the defendant in order to undertake some further step. Sometimes it's a transaction, sometimes it's um, entering into a purchase, but that sort of um, uh, 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 factual step um, uh, on which you're relying on the defendant's advice. That combines the defendant's wrongdoing with some other risk, which creates a need to separate out losses. Now, if that is what engages this, it might explain a case like Lloyds Bank and McBain's uh, Cooper Consulting, in which scope of duty wasn't thought to be relevant. In that case, a project manager uh, who was signing off um, construction interim payments included sums that weren't within the contract that a bank had offered to lend. So simply signing off a certificate, but including amounts for third floor works that, were, that weren't within the scope of the, um, uh, the loan to the client, 
uh, and there was no need to undertake a scope of duty analysis. It wasn't helped to consider the, 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 the SAMCO process because there hadn't been any step or transaction into which the defendant's reliance um, uh, had placed the claimant. Uh, this, it seems to me, is the fundamental feature of SAMCO and why it applies. It is that the defendant makes a contribution to supply material, which the client will take into account in making his own decision on the basis of a broader assessment of the risks. And in those circumstances, the defendant has no legal responsibility for the decision. And in that context, uh, it's probably worth reminding ourselves of what Lord Hoffman had said. He said, how's the scope of duty to be determined? In the case of an implied contractual duty, the nature and extent of the liability is defined by the term which the law implies. In the case of, as in the case of any implied term, the process of one of construction of the agreement as a whole in its commercial setting. And that might explain why in a contractual context, this is all less relevant, because the sorts of exercise that we're discussing um, in the professional advice cases tend to be dealt with as a matter of contractual implication uh, and an allocation of risks in, in the context of contractual discussion. Uh, so one example that springs to mind is a construction delay claim. Uh, that is a situation which is not based on care and skill, but where the employer might have responsibility or might have warranted responsibility for certain kinds of events that will cause delay. The contractual have warranted responsibility for other events that might have caused delay. And it's a similar analysis of trying to separate it, separate out the responsibility. And that is an exercise that's routinely undertaken um, in the construction court. And it's never done by reference to scope of duty. The way in which the courts tend to approach it is by focusing on the interpretation of the contract and if, and if necessary, um, a, a, an allocation of responsibilities through the express and implied terms of the contract. A couple of concluding comments then. As the law stands, the recoverable losses that result from negligent advice depend on two things. Uh, the first is identifying the purpose of the duty the second is identifying the sufficiency of the connection between the risks that the defendant is responsible for and the particular loss. Uh, you can use the counterfactual analysis as a cross check, but it is not always uh, intuitive uh, and it can lead uh, to problems if you don't frame um, the counterfactual carefully. Uh, and thirdly, in commercial claims, allocation of risk is likely to depend on causation in implied terms. Uh, that brings an end uh, to my talk. There are a few questions. Charles. Hello. Um, unfortunately, Seb, uh, I think we've actually run out of time, um, unfortunately, to answer any questions. Um, but what we'll do is the questions that we have received, um, we will address them separately um, and follow up after um, this webinar. But thank you very much for everyone's engagement. I appreciate parts of certainly my talk. Um, we were quite dry. Um, so thank you for bearing with us. Um, and thank you very much for joining us um, today. An email will be following um, this webinar with a link to both of our presentations. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or um, you want further advice, um, feel free to drop David Field or an email um, or contact the clerks in your local centre. Um, we both hope that uh, you found today informative and that you will join us for the next commercial team webinar, details of which will follow. Um, but many thanks again for joining um, and we will say goodbye now. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.